Hello, I'm Walt Bartman, and I'm the uh, founder and director of the Yellow Barn Studio at Glen Echo, Maryland. And uh, we have uh, started doing instructor interviews. We're uh, interviewing Lisa Zadravec today, and uh, she's one of our top uh, instructors, a, a real master of uh, colored pencil. Uh, she's been teaching it for many years, and uh, we're lucky to have her as an instructor at the Yellow Barn. And I, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, have her uh, tell us a lot about what she does and how, how she approaches uh, her work with her students and uh, make you just familiar with who she is so that you'll be able to have an opportunity to maybe perhaps study with her. I think anyone who's been in the field of art, uh, sometimes you know we have these different uh, disciplines which we think are uh, really special and sometimes we just stick with, say, oil painting. But honestly, uh, try your hand at uh, colored pencil as well, because I think that from the standpoint, if you love to draw and uh, you love color, you're going to have a, a unique experience. And uh, Lisa is really a professional, a real master. Uh, I can't think of anybody else who's had the experience and is, uh, is, is dedicated and has the um, talent uh, that she has in, in the field of colored pencil. So we're lucky to have her on our faculty. So Lisa, I'm gonna turn this over to you now here. Um, and we're going to ask you some questions. Uh, and the first one is, um, how did you start? Where did you uh, pick up the uh, this inspiration to become an artist? I think I grew up with it because I grew up around writers so there was arts in my family, a um, couple generations of published authors. And uh, my mother was a poet. So um, I like to think that, well, she also worked, worked for the Washington Post. So she took me to events and galleries and important things around town growing up in Washington, DC. Um, so I just had the idea that my work would hang at the National Gallery. I'd lived at East Hampton, Long Island, you know, <laughs> like a child things. But um, also being around people who work in the arts, you have the sense of what the creative process is. If you want to make no money in the arts, be a poet. Um, we think we're we're pretty low down with the, being um, visual artists, but um, the poets really do their craft for a love of making excellence you know i'd know a, a a poem would be on my mother's desk for a couple of years till one word was corrected so you have that sense of striving for that that excellence and and doing your work because you're doing your work um and also um i know you were going to ask why we do what we do and i'll tell you because if i don't do it i'll get really cranky and you don't want to be around me so it's, it's what I do, it's how I express myself and I'm always doing my art. You know, I wouldn't tell my daughter not to dance, my sister not to write, my sister's a, a playwright. And, um, you know, and I have to do my art. It's just, it's just who I am, so. Yeah, and so where did you grow up? Did you grow up here I, in Washington? Yeah, I grew up in Washington, DC. And actually I was at the Corcoran School of Art both at the college age level, but back when they didn't have all these children's programs like they have now all over the place. So I was at the Corcoran on Saturday mornings when I was 10 years old in Eric Rudd's adult class. And if you don't know who that is, he's one of the founders of the Washington po Project for the Arts who took me as seriously as any adult student except when I was running through the dark room. But you know, my painting was spoken of and spoken about as importantly as any adult because I was in an adult class. So it's like yeah. where do you put a child who wants to paint in the painting class. So, so there you go. So that's where you got a lot of your experience then was it the Corcoran? Mostly at the Corcoran, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that's uh, the main education that I've had. And how um, did you get into colored pencils? So when I was there um, in the 80s, early 80s, about 1980, uh, Jody Musoff, who is a colored pencil artist locally, I believe she's out in Middleburg. Um, she came to speak to our first year class um, and um, and I picked up colored pencils and didn't put them down. I also was studying painting with uh, Bill Newman, who does the Marge method of art, but in the 80s he was doing colored pencil as well. So it was it was a medium we were using. 
But the um, Merger method of painting is a layering and it's a wax based medium. So the color pencils always felt comfortable in my hand that I would be able to layer with them. Um, now, this is long before Alkyd mediums and whatever, and you'd have your Monday painting, your Tuesday painting, your Wednesday painting, and Thursday, you could go back to your Monday one. So I always felt that the colored pencils had a much more immediate feel to them, although they're very labor intensive. Um, if I want to layer with them, I can layer immediately. I do not have to wait for the oil paint. Plus, there's another thing a lot of people don't know about colored pencils. They think of it as the fun coloring medium. You know, you're thinking Crayola. Uh, proper colored pencils, professional grade pencils have professional grade pigments in them. They're all tested by ASTM, just like all our paints are. Um, and they're in a stick with binders, like a pastel, like a tube of paint. You know, there's, there's professional grade pigment in them. All of our visual arts are here's pigment, here's a surface. What am I applying it with? And with colored pencil, you're applying it with the pressure. Mm -hmm. So it does relate to painting the way that a lot of people will call a pastel piece of art a painting rather than a, you know, a drawing. You're not drawing with the pastels, you're painting with them. So I have a sort of painterly um, style of applying. Uh, my colored pencils. You can apply it like a drawing. You can apply it if you're coming at it from watercolor, you'll probably leave a lot of negative space and come at it a little lighter. Um, I really go at it a little more like an oil painter and do the layering mm -hmm. and I'm applying pigment with pressure. Yeah. And I think your your approach is really sophisticated. And, uh, you know, when students uh, do take the class, I mean, they do really learn a lot about color, which I think is very important too. I mean, it's a uh, interesting thing that you blend both the drawing and color, which I, I think in a lot of cases, uh, drawing teachers don't. They don't bring that uh, that dimension to the you know to their teaching. Um, That's one of the first things I do with them is that I'll I'll pare it down sometimes and just give them you know a limited number of pencils and make them mix just as if they had a palette uh -huh. and they were learning to mix their paints. No, that is, yeah, it's very important. Even the, with hundreds of colors there are, you have to know the, the nuances and become familiar with the different uh, things you can do with them to blend and mix them, yeah. Yeah, well, you have, a, you know, your, your career is, uh, I mean, you've been doing this for many, many years. So you've uh, really have the experience of working with all levels of students. And, you know, I think the, you know, when you look at the work that's produced in your classes, it's all really excellent work. And I think, uh, you know, I've always been impressed when I see the work because I sometimes, uh, you know, it's uh, being an oil painter, I'm only thinking about the brush. And I think that this is a, this is a medium that really offers a lot. So the, um, the thing that I wanted to ask you, okay, um, we're going to go on to you and your work. All right. And uh, you, you started as, a, as a, a, an artist you know, being in, in uh, at the Corcoran, but then you uh, blossom into being a teacher and a very well-known teacher. Uh, how did that happen? Well, I didn't plan on it. Otherwise I would have gotten that teaching degree and then I'd, you know, lose myself in a public school system or something like that, but probably, you know, make the salary that goes along with it. Um, I started teaching when I became a mom because I was looking for a way to keep on supporting myself, but from home to stay home with my kids. So I homeschooled my kids primarily. And uh, there's a lot, there was a large homeschool community in Northern Virginia where I was living at that time. Um, and uh, so I just started taking, I started with 18 students, four of whom I think were related to me my first semester teaching out of my house. So I started teaching there and I just started teaching everywhere. like summer camps, churches, Michaels, the rec center. And after a while, after 25 years or so, everybody's taken a class with me somewhere and, and you have 25 years under your belt. So a lot of times I have to warn my, my students that I might just talk to them like a kindergartner <laughs> and throw them off the deep end with three pencils and make them work for it. You know, the kids don't have a problem doing it because you're the big person in the room. The adults sometimes want to question, but but it all works out. I think that's why I get some of the results I do because everybody's a kindergartner when they're starting. Yeah. 
Well, this is it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that we both share this long career now. I mean, we're both in, in that kind of uh, period of life where we've worked with a lot of students. And I think, uh, you know, it's really gratifying, I know, for myself to have that um, connection with people. Uh, you're really a, a people person, and I've watched you in your classes, and, you know, they're all intensely involved in what you do. I want to ask you now, we're going to go to your work. We're going to share the screen, and we're going to go to your work and have you just talk a little bit about your work. And I think uh, this will be, I'm sure, a little bit more comfortable because uh, we all like to do that all right, with our, our work. So I'm going to start here. You should be seeing a power. Did I share the screen? I did. Should be seeing a PowerPoint. Um, yeah. We're going to start with the, the first slide and we're going to go to uh, this. Uh, this is just something that you sent that gives an idea uh, of how you and the work that you've, um, you know, that you've uh, done. And I think, uh, you know, the work everybody can see here really is quite masterful. So, oh, that's on the second slide. You're still on the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the. Um, Here's the first piece. Do you want to just talk a little bit about your work and uh, what you're Yeah, I love in? to do portraits. I love to do uh, children and women are, are very often my subject because these are the stories I know and they're very often narratives. So here's this girl and she's catching the scrub jay in Florida. There's lots of bits of this um, picture that are collaged together from her entire trip. Um, it's not one photo and I copied it. As a matter of fact, the bird, I had to purchase the rights to use that photographer's bird because it was the only landing scrub jay, even though I made changes in its position that I could get. So I very much, uh, long before Photoshop or anybody was doing that, in my head, I put together all this whole story. These pieces take a long time and a, a whole story develops about this girl and a lot of um, photo references are looked at. Um, I can't remember the artist right off the top of my head, but there was this angelic picture of a girl looking up with light in her eyes. And I thought if I could get in Willow's face, this is a, a little girl I used to teach art to, that light in her eyes as she's looking for, at the bird, you know, as she's catching it. And, um, you know, and I piece it together so that the hands and the arms and everything, just like you would pose a model um, are going where I want them to go and the focus is where I want it to go. And then beyond that, it's colored pencil. It takes a long time and there's a lot of decisions that are made like a painter along the way. How much of the garden am I going to put in? How impressionistic? Where is it leading? You know, everything's going up to the, the bird and the, the bird coming down and her looking up. But, uh, you know, everything's as I'm working created towards that. And then the, just the fun of getting all the different textures and colors that you want to get. I love doing portraiture. I love to capture people who are being fully themselves in that moment. I like to tell stories about girls and women, but I'm not telling the dark story. I'm telling the hopeful story, the belief I can capture bird. I don't have to go me too or political or anything, even in my darker or older pieces. I want to say I can catch a bird and I can draw this in colored pencil. <laughs> you know, it's all about what a person can do. And, uh, you know, against all odds, this little girl, the mom said she has an affinity for birds. And I just said, may I draw her? <laughs> but then I created this. This is not, this is a fictional, doesn't exist in a photograph anywhere. So. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, um, when I look at your work, I mean, one of the things that you capture is, a, 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 you know, you, you capture the thought that's in the figure, in the figure's mind. I think that's the, that's the, the for me, what I think is the, is the strength of your work. It's not necessarily that you're just really good at drawing and you can draw things the way they appear, uh, but you are giving it, a, a, you know, being able to kind of, um, direct our thoughts uh, and uh, you know we feel we can feel the pieces and they're beautifully done um, the next one perhaps you can talk a little bit about this one um, this is two little kitties sitting on a rug named butter and boots 
But what they made me think of with their little obstinate faces was the wonderful picture, the daughters of, I can't remember who, by John Singer Sargent, with the mm -hmm. big Chinese vase in the back. And they're all sitting around on the carpet and standing in the doorway and everything. And they're looking at this artist painting them like, what the heck are you painting me for? So I just thought that, that look in the, in the cat's face, like, what are you looking at? Yeah, and then putting the urn in the background and some pillows and a little bit of architecture. So it looked like the kids who were on that rug and then the doorway beyond and the older children were back in the doorway and the and the younger ones were playing on the rug, but they were all looking at the artist like, what the heck do you want? <laughs> so it just makes me laugh when I see it because it's totally John Singer Sargent inspired cats. And when you when you choose ideas, um... Are you looking for something specific when you're when you choose an idea, or do you just go with the what you feel is interesting? I think I go with what's interesting, like something interests me, and then I build upon it. For mm -hmm. instance, my next piece, uh, there was just a look on on a girl's face, and um, it's going to have to do with something about you know place in life and where we're headed and. Um, polar bears and other things, but I build on it. And all it was, was a look on her face where she just had painted her eyeshadow like candy canes. And I said, oh my gosh, she's headed to the North Pole. So I just build on it from where we're at. You know, the urn wasn't in the picture. The artist paints it in later. And how many times do you change it while you're painting? Did it start out being a white urn? How did it become a blue urn? that's all you know part of the process as you're going you know through it that and is, is it all. easy to put is it easy to put an, an say a, a blue urn in into a colored pencil drawing uh if you had already started say the floor being a brown floor do you sometimes do you... it's not because if you've gone too many layers um there is erasing in colored pencil believe it or not and thank god for the mr clean magic eraser but but sometimes not. Sometimes you go with what you have and you build on it. So you're careful about when you choose, am I gonna make changes? Um, but it does grow on you. You go from two cats who are staring at you like what the heck to, oh my gosh, I know what they remind me of. They remind me of those John Singer Sargent yeah, children's yeah. portrait. And then you just go from there. Like, am I, I putting an urn in? Am I putting a wall in? You know, what am I putting in? And and it and it grows from the two cats. I, and I can see that in in um, in your work, um, you know, that you have this kind of ability to really design things well. Um, the, um, the the reason I asked you about putting the vase on top of the floor, are you working on paper or are you working on do you work on board? I work on work? paper, and the paper I found that takes my brutal number of layers and number of changes is the Canton Me Tense paper, which is a mm -hmm. uh, pastel paper, but I use the back smoother side. You need enough tooth to take la the layers that you want, but not so much that it's bumpy, or I don't like the sanded papers like the pastel artists use. Some people like how much tooth that has. I like it to lay down like paint. So there's a you know there's a place where that works. I can also use mixed media boards and then paint them but the layering is so deep like on that floor um nowhere on this painting is the original color showing through but it is somewhat the color of the red in the back pillow okay. the original paper but it sort of informs my decision it's like putting down that imprimatur layer before you paint the portrait you have something you're working into that informs your decision now on a red paper then you get that blue vase it's like pop wow you know like that just comes out and then it's all imaginary there wasn't a blue vase i don't own a blue vase. Yeah. you know so you're making you know the room reflect in it and the cats reflect in it and all that stuff and it's like really they're not there <laughs> and you know the amount of time that you're putting into this what what kind of time uh um, fa a fast one of this size, you know, almost using the full sheet of paper, which a full sheet of paper is about 19 by 25, um, would 
to do it quickly, like the one behind me, I did that in October. So it's mm -hmm. a month's work. Mm -hmm. So what people need to understand when they're buying them is I have priced them like oil paintings because I could oil paint that faster than I color pencil. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, it's a, it's a lot of work. Now, yeah, I had my classes and everything. I didn't work eight hours a day all the way through, but I worked a month. So, you you know, uh, a small piece, eight by 10, I'm doing one little animal. Yes, you could do that in a week or so, but like, you know, you're only able to do what you're able to do in, in the hours you have. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, this is a beautiful piece, you know, very natural. I mean, honestly, uh, you can really uh, almost pick them up. I think that's one of the things that you're, you're good at as well. Uh, and here's another uh, very remarkable piece might speak of that a little bit. This one was mixed media board. So there is some watercolor underneath. However, I went over it or things like the uh, smoke and the fire and all of that um, is colored pencil, mm -hmm. but made to look like and work with the, the watercolor. Um, and this was done on mixed media board. And uh, I think my daughter was away at summer camp. So this cat sits by the window waiting for her. It's called I dreamt hellfires while you were gone. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's probably at a campfire singing songs and roasting marshmallows, but he's imagining the apocalypse because his mommy's gone. So, yeah. <laughs> so I love this cat. So yeah, that's... this one is a very unusual composition. Um, uh, when we talk in terms of contemporary composition, like the the one prior, sort of was a John Singer Sargent. You could feel that, but this one is, uh, you know, just the severity of the divisions of the of the rectangle uh you know and how you kind of uh create the focus on the cat i mean i, I can't take my eyes off the cat by the way i know that the angle of the earth the you know when everything's gone cockeyed but but i think that one thing we've learned from photos and magazine looking at magazine croppings and tv and movie editing is zoom in on what's important because although the other one reminds you of John Singer Sargent, I didn't do a 20 foot canvas and include all four children and the ceiling. You know, we're kind of used to seeing things even with the cats where it's cropped in to what's important to this moment. And what's important to this moment is his gaze out there and the imaginary end of the world, you know, that's going on in the fire. So, so when you started this, did you have that in mind right from the beginning, the story, or did you? Uh... Um, you know, I had a cat that was looking out a window and a, and a good photo of a cat looking out a window, but how much I decided to zoom down the arms or continue the window or heighten the, the moment that zooms in towards him and what I would put out the window, like, are you going to just put her coming home out the window? Is he looking at a bird? And it just got like, no, I know this cat. I know why he sits at the window. The world's falling apart unless she's home. So, you know, that's what you put in. Where's a fire? Let me get a picture of a fire and start, you know, burning the world down. Yeah, so, well, yeah. It's, it's fascinating and, and really uh, very memorable. This is one of the ones of your work that I always uh, see as really um uh, such a personal image of yours that I kind of identify you with this, by the way. All right. It's really interesting. This is this is the one that uh, had uh, impacted me the most in, in a lot of ways. This is another one that I find very beautiful. And uh, maybe you can speak to this one. Uh, this one's a little different where everything tends to be more focused on the eyes and the importance of the eyes in the work. Uh, here you uh, uh, don't have the eyes looking at us. Which is which is fascinating because it's sort of like, you know, I can see the, the you know the the reference to maybe Degas uh, with the dancers in some respects, but the um, you know just the way their heads are turned in that uh, is is quite unique. Was this from a photo of both dancers together, or did you? Uh... Um, I had a lot of photos of them. They were together and they were separate in different ones and different poses and arms. All the arms belong to the front girl, by the way, in the end, because I needed different arms and I had her repose and I didn't have access to Susan. I just had, um, and and so I, but I had them pose like Degas mm -hmm. originally, like think of those Degas, you know, put your arms up, do this, do that. 
and I was snapping some pictures. Um, however, the color scheme and what came out of it was more like El Jaleo from yes. John Spear Sargent. Yeah, there's the there's cards a, there's on the wall too. and the dancer with her mm -hmm. arm and her gorgeous fingers. And then I had this empty space and my daughter was uh, rehearsing for Don Quixote. She had gotten the lead. So there's a lot of fans. So I started looking at all these antique fans. Now talk about erasing. I first put in a black Belgian lace fan and I had to remove a black Belgian lace fan because it was just too much with all of their beige. Um, I found the lace somewhere else. The, all the straps on the back of the girl and the sweat and the pins in their hair and everything is when you're close to the dancer and how much they love dancing, it's nothing like what's gonna happen when they go off and they're going off into the light on the stage. It's the straps underneath the layers of camisoles, the bobby pins in the hair, the sweat dripping, the, all of that, that when you're on the stage and the audience is just looking at the dance, um, they just see the beauty of the dance and the fans and the costume and they don't see the sweat and the, the bobby pins and the hard work underneath. And I called it Les Filles de Boheme because that's a line from Carmen and it's about love is, it says love is a gypsy child. So if you are the gypsy child to this ballet, if you are the slave to this love, you know, you are in the sweat and the bobby pins like we're in, you know, elbow deep in the paint. So it's it's a love of their dance. So I was catching the the back less pretty, but it is still pretty. <laughs> I think this is a remarkable piece. I think the uh, the feeling of the movement you can you can really sense the music in it. All right, like you said, I, I could feel Spanish music, of course. All right, just by the you know just the kind of uh, what you would find with the flamenco dancers that that same kind of when you were saying about El Jaleo. That, that has that same quality. The, um, the fascinating thing for me is just how you, there's a lot of, uh, I'm intrigued by looking at this, um, ma mainly because of the many different ways that you've used the foreshortening uh, and, and how you've uh, kind of counteracted the, the kind of balance in the, in the work. It, it's fascinating to me. You know, it's a very tonalistic piece. So, you know, you didn't bring a lot of color to it. And I think that the you know um, it works beautifully this way. So I think uh, you know if anything, um, you know it's it's uh, it's it's masterful. And I think for students, they can really learn a lot by looking at a piece like this. Uh, when you're composing, do you think in terms of what? What 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 do you uh, do you think in terms of repetition? What do you what do you think in? No, I think I find the repetition later because it's natural. You know, the shape of the front hand, the shape of the fan, the shape of the elbow, the angles, the the perspective of the guitars, and you know what's happening. It just it's it's gut feeling compositional right. But what I do is, I think I'm more that frustrated writer. Only instead of writing the whole book, I'm just designing you the book cover. <laughs> it tells the whole story. You know, I have that whole story behind it that's created. You know, I I'll come back and find some things that I just love. The the yellow reflection under the back girl's chin, or something like that, where there's a, there's just a glow, the little you know shape of the shadow on her neck and all of that. But as I'm doing it, these lines and things fall into place. And I think that's the repetition of making art over and over. I'm not consciously saying I need to repeat the fan shape. The fans weren't in there ever. It was, I was doing they got arms and they needed something that shape to fill the void. So I added the fans in. So then you get all the repetitions of the angles. And yeah, and I, I think that that's, um, you know, one of the things for me, uh, the, the, the dramatic change of size. This reminds me of, uh, there's a John Singer Sargent figure where we're kind of looking down on her and her perspective is, is really unique and this uh, perspective is as well. Uh, so it's, uh, have you followed this up with any other dancer uh, pieces or is this the only one that you've done? Um, this 
is I have one of my daughter when she was very little. Um, I'd like to do more since my daughter is a ballerina to do some more dance related. The hard thing is they're interesting parts all the way from the tip of the fingers down to the ballet shoes to get all of that in the picture. You know, here we're just upper body and arms. Mm -hmm. What would you do if you wanted to get the full pose and then you don't have that cropping? You have to do something huge or draw something so small it doesn't end up being a portrait anymore. Um, but yeah, I've, I've worked on a couple of things and I'm sure there's more dance stuff to come. Yeah, this is a, a great subject for you, I think. Um, the, um, the interesting thing is that this was one where the color is, um, you know, uh, like I said, it's tonalistic, it's more unified color. And, uh, you know, it glows with this kind of gold, uh, gold light that I think you feel through everything. Uh, the next piece, speak of this one. Yeah, this one, um, this beautiful girl, this is as close as we'll get to a self-portrait, although it's another person, it's not me when I was young. Um, she's actually, you know, practically part of the family. She's my daughter's roommate and she grew up in my house doing art since she was seven. But I think there are elements in here that are autobiographical. You know, I started to draw her and I was trying to find dragon wings. Well, there aren't any pretty dragon wings. And I had a, a page of moths, very colorful moths. What's the difference between a moth and a butterfly is that one comes out at night and one's in the day. If you're up north, they're really colorful and beautiful. So the coloring is from a moth, the bend is from a dragon. This girl is very creative like me. And when you're clothed in only your creativity or things you can make, the handmade knit and crocheted you know, gloves and scarf, which were by the way, really fun to draw. <laughs> All that little pattern to make it believable to somebody who actually crochets that they could see the, the, the marks in the crochet or the knit parts and everything. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, she looks very beautiful, but there's a vulnerability and there's a, you know, is she naked, only clothed with wings? She's only clothed with the creative aspects that surround her. So um, I think that comes out that there's a, a vulnerableness to the way she looks on top of all the beauty, because we're mm -hmm. living clothed in just the beauty of what we make, but it's very fragile. It's like a piece of yarn, a butterfly wing, you know, or the bare trees, you know, which give it also another feeling of the chill of, of the world mm -hmm. when that's all you've got is beauty, you know. It's so. interesting, I, I, you know, you mentioned the poetry in your family, all right, and there, there's a poetic quality about this, and I don't know how much you use poetry uh, or try to understand your work through poetry, but I tend to do that with my own. I tend to paint the stuff and then think about the poetic nature of it. And I can really feel, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a romance here, all right? And the, um, uh, the interesting thing is uh, it's um, the beauty that you create, uh, I think, is, uh, is quite uh, strong in this particular piece. Uh, it's a, it's, it works well. How did you, um, how did you come up with the idea? Uh, the, the figure itself, was it, uh, uh, I mean, you had the, the pose of the figure, the hands and the, and the, uh, the face and that, uh, but you had to crop it and, and do things. How did you, how did you come up? Um, with I had her with her, with her hat and her glove, um, the second hand with the rings um i had her i said you know hold your arm and do this because i need to put both arms in and not caring at some point that there were any clothes or anything and i left her like that not even thinking that she would look so naked and bare and chill mm -hmm. i was more going for color the purple the mm -hmm. the neon down the terminator line of her shadow on her face and I was doing color problems in my head, which does create mood and feeling and, um, you know, 
brings some other things out that are there in my story. Like I was saying before, there she is naked with only her creativity to, to keep her warm, um, you know, comes out and builds upon what I was doing. I mm -hmm. was doing that anyway, but then it's, oh, this really does show it. And then, you know, choosing the off color orange and purplish, you know, landscape behind at a certain time of year when I just loved the colors of it. And I thought, okay, with the yellow and the purple and with the her, with the yellow and the purple, I'll put it in, but then it's like, it's off. You've got these butterfly wings and then it looks like, you know, it's probably winter time or just mm -hmm. about to snow <laughs> back there. Oh, it's, but it's not snow good. colors and not, yeah, so. Yeah, no, this is a really beautiful piece. I mean, inspirational. You look at the what you were able to do and achieve the uh, this the, the the sensitivity of the surfaces. I think that's another thing that you do very well is the ability to communicate what a surface uh, feels like visually, and I think that that's uh, uh, an interesting attribute because uh, you know usually when we have these different what we call textures, they can be. Uh, uh, confusing, but you're the way you uh, orchestrate them. Uh, you know they all uh, enhance one another. And I think that's what, one of the things that I feel you have a really good eye for. So um, that uh, that one worked out well. How about this one? Um, this one is just a teeny teeny little thing, just about ten inches big, um, and. It took me many years to do this because it was at a certain point in my daughter's life mm -hmm. where I could see her darting off into the woods and she was allowed to have this rabbit and um, she picked the rabbit that bit everybody else. So it's her protector rabbit and, and the look in her eyes and, you know, it's very, Alice is going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> it was some difficult adolescent years. And it took me about four years to take this photo that I had taken of her at this moment with her rabbit and put it into a piece of art. And then I wouldn't tell anybody what it was about because that's private and that's her story, you know, I felt and, mm -hmm. and all of that. But people would get the look in the eye or something about the bunny and... You know, it just <laughs> caught people's eye without even knowing what the story is behind it. The cockeyed landscape and the look that she's going to just dart out. And then I called it looking back, not because she's looking back at us, but because I was looking back at that moment then. Yeah. So, yeah. it's and, uh, and So when you title your work, like that, that's very poetic. You know, the idea of looking back, you know, because poetry is this abstract way of using words you know, describe something, yeah, the, the, the faces are looking toward us, but we're looking back into the, you know, and, and I think that's uh, an interesting, um, you know, there's a dialogue here. Uh, the, the dialogue between the viewer and that bunny, you, you definitely feel the protect, you know, that it's the protector, right? <laughs> Somebody said, oh, you could just pet that bunny. And I think they just <laughs> meant like the fur looks so, you know, real. Yeah. And I thought, you're not petting that bunny. Yeah, that bunny looks... Uh... <laughs> that bunny's going to bite your hand off. <laughs> this is beautifully composed again. Uh, your ability to go after shape, I think that's another thing. Can you speak about that? Because a good example is you, you handle the bunny's shape. If we look at the bunny's shape, it's a very interesting uh, shape in the design. And then the, the shape of the face is, you know, we're not talking eyes and nose. We're just talking the, the face... As a, yeah, in, a, in a general way, there's a yeah. certain simplicity between three areas in this painting, you know, this, uh, and, uh, you know, what would you, what would you say, uh, do you think in terms of shape over object or how do you? I think in terms of reality, I guess, because I'm such a realist and that the bunny isn't always in the pretty position with both ears up where we can see both eyes or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the person who's about to dart off into the, the background isn't always all smooth and prettily composed. We're cutting off half her face. And I wanted all that texture in her face to almost look like 
you know, the movement, like if you're mm-hmm. drawing a speeding car and you have the, you know, she's turning away from you real quick mm-hmm. and you see it in the strokes in her face. It doesn't have to be softly blended. Um, so I guess what I'm saying in that is, although the composition falls into place, um, I'm dealing with the shapes as they are. If the bunny's looking at you and the ears are down and back like a mad bunny and the girl's about to turn, it is what it is and you don't have to, well, how am I gonna get her mouth in there? Well, if you did, you'd ruin it. Yeah. So don't worry about her mouth. That's where the bunny's nose cuts off her, you know, the bunny's ears cut off her nose. And then some things you just then go to heighten, you know, an arch of an eyebrow, a, an angle of the earth again, you know, somebody's world is is topsy turvy, and again, the world is too. So those things kind of move around. Do you um, do you find yourself um, with your stories for your work? Do you find any connection to literature? Oh yes, very much so. In fact, some of these earlier pieces were in. Um, were in a show I did at the library where I had literary quotes or excerpts from books or little biographical paragraphs about authors and whatever that kind of went with each piece. Um, and uh, she was probably, you know, that go ask Alice from Aerosmith, but, you know, one pill makes you small, <laughs> one pill makes you large. and the ones that mommy gives you don't do anything at all, whatever that line was, I think was with this picture. But but yeah, whether it's um, storybook, children's book, poetry, I had literature that went with each one. And I guess if you're a reading person, sometimes your mind goes to characters while you're, while you're working. I know there's one piece I did of a friend's daughter with her rabbit, and I just thought, she just looks all rumpled. She just looks like the way Beatrix Potter probably looked as a child rolling in from playing with her bunny in the field, mm-hmm. you know. And so my mind went to I'm creating Beatrix Potter, even though I'm drawing Olivia, you know. I can yeah. see that in your work. I can. Uh, that's when I touched on the literature part. It's it become it's becoming more and more obvious that mm-hmm. there's a um, you know your your um, you know your background. How much reading do you do? A lot of reading? Do you? Uh... I do. I do. Oh. I do a lot of reading, and I read. Um, I found in my uh, older years that I probably was very, very, very dyslexic as a child. That's probably why I go for the pictures, not the story. So mm-hmm. when I read, because I read carefully and slowly, and I reread things to make sure I got it right, I read deeply, and then I only read things that are well written and that I love. My mother used to be the uh, director of the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. So I used to say, I'm a, write, I'm a reading snob. I only read from authors I've met. Because <laughs> I'd go down to the Folger Library and get to meet all of them at the readings. So, But I love poetry. And she said I was her best um, first reader, even, in front, even before her poetry friends. Because I'd always find that one word that just jumped out. And that word doesn't belong there. Yeah, I can so see that was, it. Or it doesn't belong there. It belongs there. You've got to be that editor when you're an artist. So. Well, and I think you bring that to your work. It, it's, yeah. it's very obvious. I mean, it uh, it is. And then you have this uh, little. Uh, this is a different. This is a different piece. Right? right, but with the animals, they also have their character, their sense of wonder of the world. You know, this little duckling who's still fuzzy with all his little wet feathers. Um, I called it Maiden Voyage because he looks like he was just christened over the head with little bubbles. But if you were out for your first solo swim, you know, I'm catching something in the animals where I think that that's how they feel. Just like I'm, there's the girl who says, I can catch that bird and puts her hand out. And, uh, you know, this little duck says, I can swim by myself, mom, and goes out. So you're still capturing that. And then the fun with colored pencil is, although from top to bottom, this is tonal. If you see the pinks at the top and then it goes into like greens and blues Mm -hmm. and purples, all that color that I created in the water was my fun of like painting. Um, However, it takes way longer (laughs) than a brush stroke. And then to create all those little 
hair like fe baby feathers and the bubbles and make it believable, you know, the duck bill. That's all just so much fun to capture that realism that would be hard to do if you didn't have a pencil point. If you had that broad brush to paint the water, well, then you can't paint the water droplets and the little hairs. Yeah. So, well, you can, but they're harder. Now, <laughs> it's you, nice find to have yourself, a you find yourself sharpening your pencils a lot? Um, I find myself sharpening my pencils judiciously because you feel that you are wasting some in the sharpener. So you sharpen them carefully and you use good sharpeners and harder pencils that you use for fur um, and feathers, they don't need as much sharpening. So you, you give them a nice point to start with and it usually lasts through your drawing session for the most part. Hmm. But then some that are softer and waxier, the ones that you use for uh, drawing skin or something smooth like water, um, you do want to wear them down because you want to apply all that pigment. So um, I just want to get, sometimes you just want to pull the wood back. Some people do sharpen them just with a knife and so that they can just, or, or they use an extender so that they get a longer point. Um, I just get a good sharpener and, and um, be careful not to let that wood scratch the paper because mm -hmm. then you've got a scratch to fill in. And you don't but I'm, be... I'm sloppy, so I'm good at fixing all the mistakes. Do you do, you do a lot of blending or do you, is it all hatching? Oh, it's blending. It's it's um it's layering and increasing the pressure as the layers build. Okay. So in, so so there's um when you want something smooth like skin or water or whatever, you're just layering and layering and layering and trying to remove that feeling that there's a pencil stroke there. If you're doing fur or feathers, it's almost the reverse and you even can use different pencils harder pencils, like I said, instead of your Prismacolors, you're using your Polychromos pencils, you know, so you're using different pencils so that, and there's um, the subtractive, you know, removal with the, with the um, erasers and um, even some scratch marks that we in the old days used to do with an X-Acto blade and damage our pictures and our paper. Um, now we use a slice tool, which is a ceramic blade that just can almost split a pencil stroke in half so that it's thinner and that you can then add pigment on top to fill that split and get tiny, tiny, tiny little bits. So that's just mm -hmm. one of the drawing techniques to get the realism in the fur where I want my skin to look like skin. I don't want it to look like I drew skin. Mm -hmm. I want my fur and feathers to look like fur and feathers, not like a drawing of fur and feathers. You know, that's, that's where you wanna be when you're gonna go realist. Do you see yourself in any way being like M.C. Escher? Oh, what an interesting choice. <laughs> um, I guess in the sense that you want to be uh, precise and um, accurate and that you like the details, you get lost in the details. You know, yeah, going, going up a staircase of Escher or getting in his hatch marks is very much like trying to make these little feathers look like they got wet and they were all like pulled mm -hmm. down by the water in the wet areas. You can get lost in the in the patterns and the details of things. And that's one of the fun parts of, of doing colored pencil in the realist way. I mean, colored pencils can be used a lot of different ways, you know, and, but I tend to go for the realist and the, the colored pencil society of America people. And, you know, those type of, color pencil artists, the photorealistic artists, they're going for that. They're, they're looking for that. Like, what is your mastery of, of getting me to believe that's a real duck in a, in a real pond, you know? Yeah. So. No, I, I can see that when we were talking about the water, the little water droplets, that's what reminded me of Escher. Oh. All right. So that was the, uh, that was the, yeah. the point there. Uh, and then you have this beauty. Which I think Which again uh, is another one of just, you know, just going on and on with fur and um, and the fur was so fun and there's different fur, there's different lengths of fur on an animal, you know, what, there's different directions of fur. Um, the tail is different than what's on the nose and the nose is different than what's on the cheek. And once you get go there, then you know, the bark is different on the branches than the trunk and the what direction your your pine needles are facing. And 
put a pine cone in. So it just kind of went on and on, even down to the, the blurry background where I was just overloading with detail as I went along. Um, so, and, and also learning about different animals because as I've added more animals to my stories, I don't, I don't know every animal in the world. And this was a new one on me, kind of like a mink. It's called a pine marten. So he's uh, a northern animal and probably more of them in Europe than hmm. here, although I think they have them in Canada. So, um, okay. but I hadn't come across this before, this animal. So I did a little research about it. Where does it live? Where, you know, so it does like to be in the forest. So, there well, you one go. of the things that I'm seeing with your work is a lot of variety of different ways of handling composition. And this is one where you have a lot of circular rhythm in the piece. And I think the, um, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how you're, um, you know, doing the, these, uh, these pieces. Uh, this one? This one I did years ago, and it actually got a ribbon of something honorable mention or whatever at a Yellow Barn member show back when. Um, and I completely created this water which I felt like I wanted to use water in the color of there's a painting of the tempest that was done by oh, I'm going to say the wrong artist uh, but anyway it's very green ocean and the red-haired woman was there but my daughter liked the story of the selkies so here she's bursting out of her skin and coming up out of the water and it's that decision moment as you reach adulthood. Do you belong to the sea creatures? Do you belong to the land people? You know, yeah. um, you, you, you could take it a different way. You could say as a, as a multicultural child, you know, which culture do you belong to? Which, uh, are you going to stay with your kids? Are you going to grow to be an adult? You know, like there's a lot of questioning in this age. And so I had put my, my daughter in the, in the selkie picture um, and then just had fun creating this ocean, which a yep. surfer girl, I was teaching her how to paint a wave once at Michael's had a silly lesson to paint the wave. And she was telling me how the water has those little lines in it. And certainly it does as it passes over rocks and sand and if you put your finger in it and everything like that. So to create the texture of sea foam or a wave or have light coming through the water as it thins up and goes into a curl, you know, it's so much fun to do anyway. This is, this is interesting. I'm going to ask you a question about this because I don't know if you've changed the, the, the medium from the standpoint of what colored pencils you're using or whatever, but this feels much more like a painting than it does a drawing. I used to walk past this picture which in person, a lot of times my pictures look, I think even better than they do when they're photographed. The camera's eye seems to photograph the surface or the last layer I drew. Whereas when I'm looking at it, I can look through and see all the layers a little better than the camera picks up. Scans do pretty well on smaller pieces, but I've never scanned one of my larger pieces. So I used to walk by this piece and go, you really drew that. You really drew that because it did have that painting feel. And so when it was purchased, I kind of missed it. My daughter and I had to sing to it and cry a little bit, but well, it's know, a, it's a, it's it was a, purchased. And then we went, oh, I miss it. Cause I used to walk by it and say, you know, in person, the look and feel of that paint look to it, the, mm -hmm. the number of layers and what that does really came across. Yeah. Better. And that's, that's what I'm getting out of this piece, which is very unusual. Um, okay, and then I think this, I think this is the last one. So we're gonna um, just, you know, for me- Just say, ooh and ah, she's beautiful, her baby's beautiful. This is- But, but uh, you know what painting this is taken from the, the lot of people did the, the girl, it's called Choosing and the girl smelling the rose. She has long red hair. She was a famous actress, Dame Ellen, um, uh, Edith Ellen. I'm going to forget her. I'm so bad with this type of thing. But anyway, she was a famous, um, John Singer Sargent painted her as Lady Macbeth. Okay. She had this great red hair. Ellen Terry. Thank you. And she had the rose and another painter painted her with the rose. 
and it was called choosing. Um, and so when I did Juliet and her baby and put them together in that, I added in the, the hand and the rose. She just had a tired baby on a hot day leaning <laughs> on her. But I thought, oh, let me make her like the girl smelling the rose on the side. And so you did a, you did a magnificent yeah. job with this. This, this yeah. I think, ending with this piece is the way to end because really, truthfully, it, it takes in not only the beautiful rhythmic quality that you, you create from uh, the, the movement of the figure, the child into the, the mother and then carrying us into the background, but the color combinations and the way you handle the light and the drawing and the sensitivity. Uh, and then the beauty, it's hard to make something beautiful. And this is one of the things that I think you're uh, good at, all right? And here's a great example of that, because this is a, you know, a, a picture of beauty. And I don't think a lot of artists can make beauty. So I think that's one of the, you things. know, and then some of it, whether it's the arch and the lattice and then her gingham and whatever, and, you know, changing the color of whatever the baby was wearing and all of that. But there's also that moment too, as a mother, and, and that's where the, the, it's just called the roses and she's got a rose in her hand, but I'm remembering the other painting is called choosing and the slightest thing, just that little stretch of the tendon in her neck whether it's from the weight of the baby or whether it's from the weight of motherhood, it's there, it's under the surface. And you're, you, you're not just, you probably have an exhausted baby on a hot, sweaty day who's leaning on you. I did remove the sweat from the, you know, didn't, well, didn't yeah. draw the sweat in, but you know, you have a hot, tired baby that you're holding. There's a little too, more to it than beauty. There's beauty and there's the weight of it. You can yeah, there's motherhood. There's baby. there's all kinds of things that are yeah. being communicated here. Yeah. You know, it, and it is very poetic. Uh, I mean, from the standpoint of the romantic nature of it. All right. So I think that you really feel an underlying quality. You know, I I, I tend to, uh, you know, like the uh, when I talk about work. I mean, you know, the elements of description. I think you're very good at. You know. But I think here, particularly, um, the way you create the emotion uh, is what I think is uh, and, and the, the sensual emotion. It's not a, an aggressive, um, you know, rough feeling. It's definitely the, this kind of uh, uh, the, the tactile feeling of the of the surface, you know, just enhances the feeling of the pose and and all the colors work well together, too. So this one uh, was a beauty. Now I'm gonna add, we're gonna just, because of our time, we're gonna ask you to go through with your um, uh, student work. But looking at your work, there's no doubt the students can learn a lot from you, all right? And I think that this is one of the things that, that I see with the, the work that your students have done. And maybe you can just speak to, here, here's, the, here's the most important question I'm going to ask you, and that is, uh, what do you feel is important in the work of your students? Well, first, first and foremost, they don't, I don't want them to be me. I'm not creating mini me. I love to do my stories. I love to do my pictures. I like to draw my kids, but if they do still life or floral or animal or portrait, we do all of that in class. And my thing I want them to get is number one, get the concept that I'm teaching on whatever level you're at. This, by the way, was her first portraiture class. This, this person who did this one, it's just lovely. Um, you know, and, and some of those that you'll see, um, I, I left this woman out on her own, you figure it out, but don't come back with like just a shadow. There's so much color in that shadow, you know, like let, let them skin their knees and own the knowledge um is is my way i guess it's that charlotte mason montessori training as a teacher that like makes you this was this person's very first drawing ever Maybe in color pencil yeah. yeah just so so there's there's that sense that you can do it you are going to create something beautiful you're gonna you're gonna get the concept and you're gonna understand it and enjoy it i have people who come and they're very expressionistic and here i'm roping them in and making them be realist, but they can enjoy it and they can they can find their way through it um, and then apply what they learn to their more expressionist at work. I still have an expressionist from the 80s living deep inside me who likes to see all the pencil strokes and, and all of that. So I want them 
number one, to become the artist that they're trying to be, to use everything that they're learning from me, the, the color mixing, the realism, the use of a new medium, and then bring it back into, now what do you wanna draw? How are you gonna use it in your art? So I want them to become the artist they, they're gonna be. I don't do like, uh, there are a lot of people out there who teach these color pencil classes and everybody leaves with the same picture. They've all been working on the same thing, like step one, step two, and we'll all go home with the same, same picture. I let them make as many choices as they possibly can because a, if you own the knowledge, if you, if you make your mistakes and make your choices, then you own the knowledge. If you can turn around and narrate it to someone else or teach it or explain it to someone else, that's the mastery of it, is when you can bring it back and, and, and express it to someone else. So that's my mastery as a teacher is obviously I'm having some success in explaining it to other people, but also their mastery and being able to take whatever they learned from me and bring it back to their own art. This woman with the oranges loves working on black paper. I think there's another one of hers in here, a dog or something, but she just fell in love with it. This was a teenager. I was giving them a landscape and it was rather realistic and she went her own way with it. And I love what she did in one of my uh, summer classes, um, which was which was great. Oh, maybe the dog wasn't in there. No, I don't think the dog's dog. there. The, the yeah. thing that um, what we see with what you're doing, uh, you know, with your students, I mean, for me, uh, the, one, the quality of the work is excellent. And then to see the, um, uh, you know, that you're not necessarily just having them copy what you're about, which I think is really another aspect that I think uh, brings a, a more personal side to their own work, which I think is the kind of thing that you have in yours. So I think that that's, uh, um, you know, what we, what, as teachers, that's what we're always looking to do is to get our students to not just be students, but to become artists, which I think is... Yeah, graduate uh, them, yeah. you know, let them you get graduate. their diploma. Yeah. So, uh, and, and it just felt so good at the um, the members drawing show that the top pieces were both students of mine. That's and then, of course, I got to win the <laughs> the, the um, People's Choice instructor piece. So, yeah, the, the, that, but I was very, very, very gratified when I, you know, somebody comes back to me and they're like, "I got second place in portraiture at, at Women's Club of Chevy Chase," and it's like, "Wow, I got second place in portraiture at Women's Club of Chevy yeah. Chase the year before." You know, and to have my student step yeah. up, you know, and and get that prize the next year really well, says you're, you're doing something. And, so. and you are working with not only beginning students, but you have experienced students who turned to colored pencil, I'm sure, because it's a new medium for them and uh, and actually adds to their awareness or their way of uh, really perfecting their seeing. You know, when you look at what you're doing and how closely you're looking at things, you know, and how closely you're studying something, uh, you really get to know it. And I think that's communicated in the work as well. So, I, 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 you know, what, I, what I've seen today, I'm really impressed by. I've, I've been impressed all along, and I'm glad we could share it with our, our students now so that they can uh, make, uh, you know, choices to take your class. We definitely think that the, if they don't, they're, they're going to miss something. So, um, you know, you've made colored pencil a very important part of the Yellow Barn curriculum, and I think that that's, uh, that's an important thing, too. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we go? No, I think that's that's it. Yep. I think we covered everything. I think we did. And I and uh, if anything, uh, it, it's great for people to get to know who you are. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'm going to say good night, and um, we'll we'll be talking. And uh, hopefully, people, if anybody's interested, all you have to do is go to the yellowbarnstudio.com uh, website and enroll in one of um, Lisa's classes. You can go under instructor, find Lisa's name, and uh, click on her classes. It's easy. I think I'm the only Z still. So. Yeah, there you go. That's true. All right. Okay. All right. Good, Thank good you. night. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.